Spy Man here. This was an absolute betrayal, Kruby. I've been a stalwart defender of this show since Volume 4, but this? I can't excuse this. You spent the entire season building the relationship between them. This was baiting in the purest sense of the word. A ship not happening does not mean queer baiting. Come on, people. This death serves the narrative. If MLM are feeling sick to their stomach from the episodes of your show, which included the brutal murder of a gay man, then you're not doing it Ruby right. Ruby didn't queer bait, y'all. There has been no barrier gaze in Ruby. My don't heart just start. hurts. I don't know what to say anymore. Does Kruby understand how awful this is? I'm only 16, and every media I consume that's like Ruby or God forbid Voltron has done this. Do they know how discouraging that is to People a young gay person? People need to stop going after Kruby. Clover's death isn't queer baiting. Since the guy isn't even confirmed as an LGBTQ plus character, people need to calm down. Kruby, you knew what you were doing and how it looked and chose to go through with it anyway, all the while telling us to trust love at the start of every episode. Congrats, you broke that trust. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. Let's rewind a little bit. It was January of 2020, and the seventh volume of Ruby was nearing its close. The stakes had never been higher, with Salem launching an invasion on Atlas, Ironwood choosing to abandon Mantle, and trust between allies breaking down. It was poised to be the strongest finale the show had seen in years. Then, the release of the volume's penultimate episode, with friends like these, sparked immediate controversy when the partnership Crow and Clover had been building throughout the season ended violently with Clover's death. Fans who read their relationship as a budding romance took to social media to criticize the show for queerbaiting and perpetuating tropes that are harmful to queer viewers. In turn, their criticism was rejected by other fans, who staunchly maintained that the show had done no such thing and the backlash was baseless. Now, a year after the release of With Friends Like These, fans remain divided by this issue even as the story progresses. With Clover's death still casting a shadow over the show, it's worth fully exploring this controversy by examining the claims of queerbaiting, the events leading up to Volume 7, Episode 12, and the fallout from it in order to understand the impact it had on its audience, the narrative implications of the episode, and what it means for Ruby going forward. Part 1. Defining Queerbaiting a lot of the debate surrounding whether or not Crow and Clover's relationship was queerbaiting seems to center on disagreements on what constitutes queerbaiting. So before we discuss their relationship, we need to understand the term itself. In the early 2010s, fans and online communities began using the term queerbaiting to discuss the phenomena of media works filled with queer subtext that didn't manifest in explicit representation of queer characters. Fans use it to describe both works whose creators adamantly deny the existence of queer subtext in their text, and works whose creators use paratexts, or materials surrounding a text, such as creator comments and marketing, to encourage a queer reading of their text, only to not provide the representation they hint at. While these works sometimes have minor characters who are explicitly queer, they hint at a queer relationship between major characters, only to never deliver. Elizabeth Bridges describes how media that queerbaits appeals to queer fans. In media, LGBTQ fans are hooked, as it were, via the powerful lure of queer representation, the wish to see people like ourselves being treated as worthy and equal in a narrative. Both fans and academics agree that queerbaiting is exploitative and harmful to queer fans. The failure to deliver the queer representation that was baited implicitly communicates to queer viewers that while the work's creators may want their viewership, they do not consider their stories worth telling. There is no singular way that academics define queerbaiting. Eve Ng uses the term queerbaiting to refer to situations where those officially associated with a media text court viewers interested in LGBT narratives and encourage their interest in the media text without the text ever definitively confirming the non-heterosexuality of the relevant characters. While Judith Fathala describes queerbaiting as a strategy by which writers and networks attempt to gain the attention of queer viewers via hints, jokes, gestures, and symbolism suggesting a queer relationship between two characters, and then emphatically denying and laughing off the possibility. 
Joseph Brennan more broadly defines queer baiting as homoerotic subtext that is never intended to be actualized on the screen. Brennan points out that fans use the term queer baiting as a means of holding media creators accountable for the ways their texts are harmful to queer audiences, noting that the term isn't static, but is modified by fans as conditions change or new imperatives arise, such as the need to label and act against representations that take the teasing of audiences further through presentations of queer representations that are actual, yet negative in some way, as is captured by the bury your gaze trope. Arguing that a work was not queer baiting because it doesn't meet a specifically selected narrow definition of the term actively ignores the criticisms that queer fans are making in favor of a meaningless semantics debate. In order to have a genuine conversation about why many queer fans found the handling of Clover and Crow's relationship to be harmful queer baiting, we need to understand the meaning they intend when they use the term. For the purposes of this conversation, let's define queer baiting as the practice of media producers suggesting a queer relationship through subtext or paratext without that queer representation explicitly manifesting in the text itself. Now that we've established what queer baiting is, let's examine how Crow and Clover's relationship was depicted throughout Volume 7 of Ruby, an irrelevant paratext to assess whether or not this relationship was queer baited, starting with the text. Part 2. Analyzing the Text the first time Clover and Crow meet is when Crow and the children are arrested. Clover is introduced in a series of four shots. The first three are composed to include both Clover and Crow as their focal points, and the last one, where his face is revealed for the first time, is shot from a low angle as if from Crow's perspective on the ground. While we don't know anything about Clover at this point, he's adorned with a rabbit's foot, a four-leaf clover pin, and a horseshoe, all things associated with good luck. This is notable given Crow's association with bad luck due to his misfortune semblance. The luck motif and framing of Clover's introduction around Crow are visual cues that indicate that Clover's character is going to be relevant to Crow's in some capacity, although there is no real indication of how. The next real exchange we get between Clover and Crow is when they are partnered up at the abandoned dust mine to take down the geist inhabiting it. Crow talks about how he hasn't worked with anyone in a long time, presumably due to his semblance, and Clover finds that unfortunate and seems to value working with others. Crow slips, but Clover catches him before he hits the ice, narratively affirming that Clover is right and Crow is better off with a partner. Then we get to the moment their relationship really kicks off. Crow's semblance has clearly been on his mind, given his comments about how working alone tends to be for the best. His fear that his semblance will hurt his allies almost becomes a reality when a beam threatens to crush Clover, and his guilt brings him to reveal the nature of his semblance. Despite their closeness, he didn't even tell Ruby about his semblance throughout her childhood and training only revealing the truth when he had no other way to explain his self-imposed isolation. It's clear that Crow's semblance isn't something he's comfortable sharing with people. In revealing it to Clover, Crow opens himself up to rejection. He can't look at Clover when he confesses that his semblance brings misfortune and that the beam falling was likely because of his presence. And in this moment of emotional vulnerability, Clover's response is this. That's so? Well, hey, don't beat yourself up about it. My semblance is good fortune. Lucky you, huh? Clover sees Crow in his vulnerability and offers him unconditional acceptance and reassurance. This is the foundational moment of their relationship that shapes all their interactions going forward. From Crow asking if Clover would consider Ruby nabbing the dust crystal a lucky catch, to Crow being comfortable enough to lower his barriers and have more personal conversations. And this foundational moment is also clearly Clover flirting. The wink and lucky you, huh? line are incredibly flirtatious on their own, but within the context of the show, they are also a direct callback to the only other time we've seen a character flirt with Crow. The Higanvana waitress served Crow a more expensive drink than was paid for, 
winked and said, Lucky you. In both scenes, a character winks at Crow, delivers the same lucky you line, and walks away, leaving Crow to watch them go. While Crow reacts to the waitress with uncomplicated interest, he is caught more off guard by Clover's flirtation and semblance, leaving him uncertain how to react. This scene, which forms the basis for the character's entire relationship, also actively introduces a romantic lens through which to read Clover and Crow's interactions. This is queer subtext. It's worth noting that this romantic lens potentially recontextualizes the scene where Crow slipped and Clover caught him, illuminating the interaction's resemblance to a meet-cute, albeit belated. Not only that, but catching someone as they fall is frequently used as a romance trope. While the scene doesn't read as romantic on its own, it very neatly fits into a romantic narrative. After the Geist is defeated, the Aesops and Crow strut out of the mine as dramatic music plays. While this shot is ostensibly a celebration of how cool the Aesops were during their fight, it leaves Elm in the shadows or blocked out entirely, while it keeps Crow, who wasn't featured in the fight, prominently beside Clover. Jean begins fawning over Clover, in awe of how good the Aesop's teamwork was during the fight, to which Clover responds, Well, Aesop's are hand-picked to perfectly complement one another, so we can focus on our assets and leave our liabilities behind. Crow has no lines in this scene, but that doesn't mean his presence doesn't convey meaning. While on the surface, Clover's words are about his team, the shot composition has another message, placing Crow at the center of the frame and at Clover's side. Given that we've just learned that Clover's semblance counters Crow's misfortune, the implications are clear. Clover is a perfect complement for Crow, and together they can focus on our assets and leave our liabilities behind. Through the framing of Crow beside Clover during the Aesop's victory shot to this discussion of complementary teammates, the scene presents the idea that Clover is the perfect partner for Crow, and vice versa. The idea of them perfectly complementing doesn't just reference their combat viability together, but suggests personal compatibility as well. In the brief screen time they've shared, we've seen Clover challenge Crow's self-blaming tendencies, being positive where Crow is negative, and literally catching him when he falls. This dialogue presents Clover and Crow as perfect partners for each other in more ways than one. Some might argue I'm reading too much into Crow's presence in this shot, but I'd like to remind them that Ruby is an animated show, and this shot would literally require less labor if they simply didn't put Crow in the frame. Animation is a visual medium, and what we see on screen is active artistic choices that convey meaning, and they should be analyzed as such. Crow appears in these shots for a reason, and the reason is to suggest Clover and Crow's compatibility. The next episode, Crow and Clover are partnered up on a supply run. They seem to have established a comfortable rapport. They're mirroring each other's body language and enjoying playing cards in the back of the transport, despite Crow's losing streak. The composition of the scene is intimate, with the frame incredibly close to Crow and Clover's faces. Clover praises Crow for offering support and guidance to the young huntsman, but Crow questions the extent to which he's had a positive impact, and instead thanks Clover for the Aesop supporting them. Clover points out how Crow deflected his compliment and reiterates how much Crow has helped them, leaving Crow speechless. This scene is important in establishing Crow's recovery. Crow's semblance has shaped the way he's been treated his whole life, and he's internalized a lot of negative thoughts about himself as a result. No one wanted me. I was cursed. Not only does he view himself as cursed, but he also considers himself dangerous to those around him because of his semblance. Between the past rejection he's experienced and the fear that his semblance will hurt those he cares about, Crow doesn't believe he can have close personal relationships with people. These sentiments are so foundational to Crow's character that they're actually incorporated into his leitmotif, or recurring musical theme. This is Crow's leitmotif. <music> On 
Unlike many leap motifs, Crows actually has lyrics associated with it from the song Bad Luck Charm, which plays during his first fight with Tyrion. Specifically, the words paired with those notes are Crow's musical identity is a statement of how he views himself as inherently harmful to those around him, reflecting how integral this unhealthy self-perception is to his character. His semblance has damaged his sense of self-worth, leading to Crow agreeing with unfair criticisms of himself and struggling with accepting praise, regardless of how merited it might be. Volume 6 saw Crow at the lowest point we'd seen him. When it was revealed that Ozpin, the man he dedicated his entire adult life to helping, was taking advantage of his trust and had no real plan to counter Salem. Crow withdrew further from the people around him, lost his sense of purpose, and sank deeper into alcoholism, drinking even more heavily than he did before. I've never seen him this bad. While the season ended with a vague implication that Crow was going to try to reduce his drinking, we only learn that he's committed himself to being sober in this interaction with Clover. This is also paired with Clover challenging him to have a healthier relationship with his identity, positioning Clover as a vehicle in Crow's recovery in terms of his self-image, partially in ways that are romantically coded. While Crow views himself as undeserving of good things, Clover compliments him, recognizes his inclination to brush off praise, and reiterates how he's helped the kids, emphasizing that Crow should accept compliments. In response, Crow has no words and bashfully puts a hand behind his head, a gesture we just saw from Blake when she received a compliment from her romantic interest. Clover is uniquely positioned to also challenge Crow's assumptions about his interpersonal relationships by virtue of his good fortune semblance. Although Crow views himself as fundamentally dangerous to those around him, his misfortune hypothetically won't be able to harm Clover, allowing them to simply enjoy each other's company without Crow having to worry that he should be distancing himself. Where Crow expects only rejection because of his semblance and considers himself unwanted because of it, Clover offers him unequivocal acceptance and signals his interest in spending more time with him. Their relationship has the potential to be everything Crow believed he couldn't have because of what he believes about his semblance. And in the privacy of the truck, Clover gazes at Crow with half-lidded eyes, his gaze unmoving until Ruby interrupts the moment. This heavy gaze, contextualized by Clover's past flirtations, suggests Clover's desire for Crow, challenging Crow's perception of himself as unwanted on a different axis. It's worth discussing the way gazes like these are commonly used in queer-baiting media. Bridges describes knowing nods, subtle stolen glances, or a character gazing at another for a beat too long as the hallmarks of queer coding in instances of subtextual queerbaiting. As she points out, while these may go unnoticed by straight viewers, queer viewers are primed to pick up on these signals as the queer community has used similar cues to identify each other. Crow and Clover's relationship throughout the season is characterized by these sort of glances. There's Crow's wide-eyed stare after Clover's initial flirtation. Then, during Clover and Jean's exchange, Crow glances at Clover three times over the course of the conversation, which gives the impression that he's covertly sneaking glances. Later, we see Crow's gaze lingering on Clover, watching him go and even staring at the door that closes behind him until a waiter jolts him out of his thoughts. All these unspoken moments further demonstrate Crow and Clover's mutual attraction. Another thing that suggests Clover's attraction to Crow is Clover's showy behavior. We see three instances of Clover showing off for the sake of showing off. In his introduction, when he's standing above Crow twirling a horseshoe. When he salutes Crow and backflips his way into the Geist fight. And lastly, when he salutes Crow again and falls backwards out of the Manta. Each of these instances are specifically contextualized by Clover performing this behavior for Crow. He doesn't have moments like this with any other characters. With the Aesops and kids, he's friendly but reserved. His salutes to Ironwood are strictly professional military protocol. It's only his interactions with Crow that are marked with this sort of flagrant showiness. 
His showing off during the Geist fight and on the Manta are both done when Crow is the only audience for his actions. Clover is specifically being showy for Crow, showing off in order to impress a guy he finds attractive. And while Crow seems skeptical of these advances when they are acquaintances, as their relationship develops, he becomes increasingly receptive to them, responding to our final instance with a fond scoff and a genuine smile. Show off. Design elements also contributed to the romantic reading of Crow and Clover. Since its inception, Ruby has had color central to its identity and character design. In the world of the show, color is emphasized to the point where we're treated to an in-universe speech that discusses its importance, so bringing a little color theory to the table is warranted. Viewers took note of how Crow and Clover's eyes are complementary colors, with Clover's not a clover green, but a sea green that complements Crow's. This design choice only underscores the notion that Crow and Clover perfectly complement one another. This point was only bolstered by the brown-eyed concept art of Clover that appeared in the episode 4 credits, suggesting that Clover's design was actively changed to make him a better visual complement for Crow. Not only that, but two of the show's most prominent romances feature characters with eyes that are complementary colors. Another notable design element is Clover's red bandana. Many of the show's romantic couples have one member wearing a bandana in a color associated with their partner around an arm or leg. The red armband seems like a nod to the defining red of Crow's cape. While all of the Aesops have red cloth accents in their design, only Clover wears his this way. In a vacuum, these design elements wouldn't signal romance, but given the way they've been previously used in the show and the romantic subtext in Crow and Clover's interactions, they served as cues that furthered a romantic reading of their relationship. So far, Crow hasn't directly reciprocated Clover's flirtations and has been reserved where Clover has been forward. However, at the Schnee Manor, we get this exchange. Wish us luck. I mean, they already invited you, didn't they? <laughs> Clover's good fortune semblance was introduced through his flirting with Crow, and in engaging in this luck-based banter with him, Crow is finally making the leap and flirting back to Clover. The party is interrupted by the news that the heat and mantle has been turned off. Clover and Crow are given a mission to arrest Tyrion, using Robin to lure him out. Crow and Tyrion have personal reasons to hate each other, after their last fight ended with Tyrion poisoning Crow and Ruby severing his stinger. The two immediately engage each other in combat, but then Tyrion looks at Clover and back at Crow with a grin before going off to attack Clover instead, seemingly picking up on the importance of Crow and Clover's relationship and targeting Clover as a result. Ultimately, Crow, Clover, and Robin are able to subdue and arrest Tyrion and head back to Atlas. While they're in the air, Ruby calls to inform Crow of Ironwood's new plan to abandon Mantle, and Ironwood issues a warrant for the arrest of Crow and the children. This brings us to Volume 7, Episode 12, with friends like these. I'd like to preface this by saying I will be using graphic imagery from this episode, so if you'd like to avoid that, please skip ahead to the timestamp on the screen. The news leaves the group in a tense situation, and despite Crow's attempts to de-escalate, a fight breaks out. Tyrion manages to escape and crashes the plane. Outside the wreckage, Clover asks Crow to submit to arrest, saying, We don't have to fight, friend. To which Crow responds, You don't know my friends. That's how it always goes. The word friend has never been applied to their relationship before, and two lines of dialogue don't negate all the romantic coding that preceded them. They begin to fight as Clover insists upon arresting Crow. When Tyrion emerges from the wreckage and Crow turns his back to Clover to fight their common enemy, Clover attacks Crow again. During the ensuing every man for himself fight, Tyrion proposes a temporary alliance with Crow, who attacks Tyrion in response. But after Clover attempts to disarm Crow again, he accepts. Much has been said about how these events unfolded and the characterization in this sequence. But for the purpose of our discussion, we already know the only two things that matter. We know that Crow and Clover's relationship going into this episode was romantically coded. 
and we know how the fight ends. Tyrion drives Crow's sword through Clover's back and retreats. Crow stays by Clover's side as he bleeds out on the ice. In his dying breath, Clover wishes Crow good luck. And then that's it. He dies, and that's the end of the first romance Ruby had between two men. All of the romantic buildup between them was leading to this, and the writers wrote it knowing they weren't going to actually provide explicit queer representation with this relationship, which is the definition of queer baiting we established before we started this textual analysis journey. Well, this isn't quite the end. Episode 12 isn't over just yet. The light fades from Clover's eyes, and Crow cries in anguish as the sun rises over the tundra. The sky is pink with the morning light, the mountains a purple streak across the horizon, and below them stretches the blue-purple of the tundra. That is to say, as Crow mourns Clover, the background looks like a stylized by pride flag. They had Crow, a character fans have commonly read as bi since volume 3, have a breakdown next to his dead romantic interest in front of a bi pride flag. I can only hope this was some sort of mistake born of ignorance, because the alternative feels so much worse. Even ten months later, I struggle to put into words just how insensitive this is. Pride flags are not just an affirmation of queer identities, but a political statement demanding visibility and fair treatment. To see the imagery of the bi pride flag used in this moment when queer viewers are being denied that visibility is a slap in the face. The season still has one episode left, which shows Crow staying by Clover's body and letting himself be arrested. The last we see of him is a shot of Crow looking at Clover's pin, mirroring the scene earlier this season when Jean was looking at the red sash he incorporated into his outfit after Pyrrha's death. Crow mourning Clover is framed the same way they just framed Jean mourning his romantic interests further underscoring the romantic subtext between Crow and Clover. I understand if some of you are thinking, okay, I can see how Crow and Clover's relationship could read as romantic, but why are people so upset about Clover's death? Jean and Pyrrha had a romance, and Pyrrha died. It was tragic, but sometimes characters die. And that's true. The difference lies in the stories queer characters have historically been allowed to have. For decades, measures like the Hayes Code and censorship from media networks barred queer characters from the screen. When they did appear, so did an unfortunate trend. Queer characters would die at a greater rate than their cis-straight counterparts. This trend was prevalent to a point where it became a trope known as barrier gaze. Seeing so many queer stories ending in tragedy takes a heavy toll on queer viewers. As Bridges puts it, the message that the trope sends to the LGBTQ community is gay love and sex are punishable by death, happiness is unattainable, and LGBTQ lives do not matter. The unfortunate reality is queer people suffer from higher rates of depression and suicidality than the general population. According to the CDC, LGB youths are almost five times more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers. The disproportionate deaths of queer characters denies queer viewers happy, healthy representation of people like them in media. While the barrier gaze trope is most commonly discussed in cases when an explicitly queer character dies, Clover's entire relationship with Crow was coded as romantic, and for viewers who picked up on the subtext and read Clover as queer as a result, the implications his death carried were functionally identical to if he'd been explicitly confirmed to be gay. It doesn't help matters that Clover's death is characterized by common trends that appear in instances of barrier gaze. As Bridges points out, often these characters meet their unfortunate fates just after experiencing romantic fulfillment. While Crow and Clover's relationship never manifested in explicit representation, the echoes of this trend appear in Ruby as Crow finally reciprocates Clover's advances and flirts back just hours before Clover winds up dead on the ice. 
Another frequent element of barrier gaze is the characters dying for the sake of shock value. While the larger story ramifications Clover's death may have are unknown, it's indisputable that the way Clover's death was executed maximized shock value. Again, I'm going to be using graphic imagery from the show, so please skip ahead if you want to avoid that. After Clover's aura is broken, we see him getting slowly to his feet with the open tundra behind him. We can clearly see that there's nowhere for an enemy to potentially be hiding, and Crow has a clear view of everything behind Clover. When Clover does stand, we again see that there isn't anyone behind him. The show goes directly from that shot to Crow's sword being plunged through Clover's chest, with Tyrion crouching behind Clover. It's not like Tyrion can teleport. He simply isn't animated in shots where he should be visible. The creators omitted visual information the audience should have in order to maximize the shock value of Clover's death, which also was the most graphically violent death the show has had to date. It's also worth discussing how Crow's story fits into the barrier gaze trope. As was previously mentioned, the trope communicates to queer audiences that happiness is unattainable for queer people, and while Crow survived, Clover's death proves to him that he will never be able to find happiness. Over the course of the story, Crow has suffered a long series of losses and betrayals from those closest to him struggling with his alcoholism, depression, and semblance. Volume 7 set up a recovery arc that posited that Crow is a positive influence on those around him, despite his semblance. While Crow and Clover's relationship began with the narrative affirming that Crow was wrong about working alone being for the best, Clover's death is the ultimate narrative proof that Crow's fear of growing close to someone was justified, and that he is inherently too dangerous to be close to the people he loves. After all, not even the luckiest man in Remnant could survive proximity to him. Episode 12 left the only two characters the show had positioned as men-loving men, either dead or narratively unable to be happy, perpetuating the essence of the barrier gaze trope towards queer men. Part 3. Paratextual Queer Baiting Unfortunately, our discussion of queer baiting doesn't end with the show itself. As we've established, paratexts that promote a queer reading of a relationship that doesn't become textual representation are also queer baiting. As part of their marketing, the official Ruby Twitter highlighted key romantically coded moments of Crow and Clover's relationship while season 7 was airing. Not only did they post disproportionately more about the pair compared to other relationships, these posts often had a different tone than their standard fare. While the Twitter mostly shared fan art, linked to newly released episodes, or made jokes with images from the show, the posts about Crow and Clover let the canon content, and its queer subtext, largely speak for itself. Among the posts was a clip of Crow flirting with Clover at the Schnee Manor, complete with a four-leaf clover emoji, matching the way Blake and Yang's flirting was featured. No other relationships had this same sort of promo clip. Fans noticed how the marketing seemed to be pushing the romantically coded relationship to the forefront, furthering people's hopes that it would become a textual queer relationship. Amidst all of this, Ruby Amity Arena, an official mobile game, added Clover to the game with an in-game description that asserted Clover being in Crow's life might be the only chance for Crow to catch a break, framing their relationship as the only way for Crow to be happy. YouTuber Thomas Vaccaro, or Unicorn of War, describes the impact this marketing had on fans in their own video on the topic. All the tweets promoting Lucky Charms as a pairing and even the in-app descriptions for Clover and Amity Arena. These are where the suggestion of the pairing as a couple really ramps up and really sold a lot of MLM fans in particular that this pairing had the makings to become canon. On social media, people affiliated with the show also told fans to expect queer content and encouraged a queer reading of Crow and Clover's relationship. While Volume 7 was airing, Writer Eddie Rivas told fans that there were absolutely plans to include more LGBT plus characters. Given the queer subtext between Crow and Clover, it seemed that Rivas could be alluding to them. 
others on social media spoke about Crow and Clover specifically. After episode 3 was released, Kim Newman, a former Ruby animator who worked on Volume 7 and the voice actress of the Higanbana Waitress, shared a tweet that pointed out the parallel Lucky you. changes and was thrilled that people noticed the parallel. She followed up with a sexual joke about Crow and Clover. The show's community manager shared the official Twitter's Lucky you. post with a suggestive emoticon, and a number of the show's animators made their excitement about the pairing known in posts of their own across Twitter and Tumblr, encouraging a queer reading of their relationship. Fans took these signals from both official sources and RT creators as affirmations that the moments they'd read as romantic were intended to be read that way. An excitement that Ruby was finally going to have a romance between two men grew among the show's queer fanbase. This paratextual queer rating deliberately furthered the queer reading of Crow and Clover's relationship. Part 4. Negotiating Creator Responsibility Now that we've broken down the queer baiting and barrier gaze issues in Crow and Clover's relationship, we can return to the conversation around Clover's death with the context of why queer fans were upset. Amidst the controversy, one question seemed to come up a lot. Who do we blame for this mess? Some fans tried to measure out the responsibility of various creators for taking what supposedly was intended to read as a totally platonic bromance and sprinkling in the gay. Fingers were pointed at the show's writers, who penned the Lucky you. parallel, and there was speculation that rogue animators added in the wink without it being in the script, and they were responsible for the backlash. Others placed the blame heavily on the paratextual queerbaiting rather than the show content, citing the official Ruby account's tweets and the comments from animators. There were also those who saw the backlash and argued that the real problem was entitled shippers who were just stirring up a fuss because their ship sank. Or perhaps the upset queer people who simply deluded themselves into seeing things that weren't there and had the audacity to want more queer representation in a show where Blake and Yang sometimes hold hands. Given our previous discussion, the answers to some of these questions are evident right out of the gate. The show itself had queer subtext between Crow and Clover, so no, fans did not delude themselves and are rightfully upset about how the relationship unfolded. The way the marketing team and people affiliated with Rooster Teeth queerbaited a relationship they knew was going to end in tragedy was in bad taste, and criticism of their choices is warranted. The fan community has largely blamed the paratextual queerbaiting for the backlash the show received when Clover died, with some suggesting that in the absence of social media, Clover and Crow's relationship would not read as romantic. However, given our analysis of how their relationship was portrayed, I hope you can agree that just isn't true. I think it's worth remembering that a lot of the queerbaiting tweets the official Ruby account was criticized for are just snippets of the show's canon. Social media just pointed the subtext out to people who didn't pick up on it themselves, and validated and encouraged those who did. With or without the queerbaiting through paratext, the source text is still queerbaiting, and placing all the blame on the marketing and social media shields the creative team from valid criticism of how harmful their show was to queer viewers. When it comes to the various creators, I think the scrutiny the writers have faced is warranted, as it was their decision to kill Clover and their script was the basis for the other creative team's work, but attempts to isolate one part of the creative process to blame are misguided. Even if one group was deliberately adding queer subtext, it's still the director's responsibility to make sure the final product matches the intended creative vision. The creative team as a whole is responsible for their show and the harmful tropes they perpetuated in it. The reality of the situation is that Rooster Teeth wrote a budding romance between two men and then killed one of them in the show's most graphic death scene for shock value. And frankly, People in the building knew that the relationship read as romantic and knew how harmful killing queer characters can be, but they did it anyways. While Kim Newman may have left Rooster Teeth before Volume 7 aired, 
Her tweet reveals she was aware of the romantic parallels well before the volume came out. Even without Newman's words, the existence of such a precise parallel with the same words, same wink, and same character is evidence that the parallel and romantic subtext were deliberate. Not only that, but the crew was also aware of how harmful the barrier gaze trope is. During a Reddit AMA, Miles Luna shared these comments about the pilot who helped Weiss escape Atlas. Interesting story. We originally had a line for the pilot that subtly told the audience he had a boyfriend back in Atlas. This was done in our attempt to get better at having more LGBTQ plus representation. However, when scripts went out to the team, a number of crew members were concerned that our first homosexual character with a line of dialogue addressing his sexuality was going to die in the very next episode and was also kind of a selfish jerk. So we scrapped the line. Next thing we know, he's the most popular character of the volume and we're kicking ourselves for not sticking to our guns. After the character became popular, Luna regretted not making the doomed pilot explicitly gay, despite the concerns from the crew that killing a gay character would be harmful. Given Luna's failure to fully understand the concerns about the barrier gaze trope then, perhaps it isn't surprising how Clover's story played out. So congratulations, Mr. Luna. You finally managed to kill a gay man, just like you wanted to. The fact of the matter is they cut a line that established a minor character was gay for sensitivity reasons because he was going to die, only to later give Clover, a major character in Volume 7, an on-screen romance with another man despite being similarly doomed to die. In light of this, the repeated use of the word friend in episode 12 to describe Crow and Clover's relationship seems like an attempt to no-homo the relationship at the last minute to try to mitigate backlash. Ignorance would not absolve the creators of responsibility for their choices, but the awareness of both the queer subtext in Crow and Clover's relationship and how barrier gaze is a harmful trope, makes Clover's death seem less like a careless misstep and more like a choice made despite knowing the harm it would do. Part 5. Official and Creative Response Clover's death left queer fans betrayed by a piece of media and a creative team that they trusted and respected, and they were looking for answers and explanations. While there was no undoing the harm done by their choices, Rooster Teeth and Ruby's creative team could acknowledge how harmful their writing and marketing was to try to start rebuilding trust with the group that they'd hurt. Unfortunately, Rooster Teeth offered no official response. After nine days of complete silence on the matter, instead of any sort of acknowledgement of the controversy, the official Ruby Twitter instead promoted new merchandise including a set of enamel pins of Crow and Clover's emblems. Needless to say, this only further exacerbated the company's strained relationship with queer fans, who criticized how tasteless the release was and continued calling for some sort of official response. That response never came. There were a few people on the creative team who did issue statements of their own. One of the animators who made a number of posts about Crow and Clover as a romantic pair apologized for her part in building up people's excitement. While this individual apology was warranted, fans were still looking for an explanation from people with more power in the creative process. While there was still no response from the director, writer Eddie Rivas did address the controversy. In response to Vaccaro's tweets about queerbaiting and Clover's death, Rivas said, I'm sorry that some people feel that something was done to intentionally harm. Some of this is tricky to talk about, but at the risk of stepping on toes, I will say show content and marketing decisions are not one-to-one, -one, so hopefully that can be set aside later. But I get it." He later posted in a Reddit thread about the queer baiting, writing, I'll offer a writing perspective on this later, but again, I do want to acknowledge the people who feel hurt by this. If you felt that you were misled, intentionally or otherwise, I'm sure something like this feels like an enormous betrayal, and I know that must be painful. This isn't an apology, but it's a solid starting point. Rivas wanted to have a conversation about what happened and recognized the pain it caused queer viewers, and his reference to the marketing is an implicit acknowledgement of its queer baiting. Unfortunately, in the ensuing conversation, Rivas continually failed to accept responsibility for the actual writing or offer an apology for the harmful tropes it used, 
instead deflecting blame onto animators, voice actors, and the marketing. When people pointed to Kim Newman's tweet, Revis responded by saying, There is no world in which any of us working on the show have any control on what a former animator says or does. This placed the blame on Newman's tweets and ignored the textual parallel that prompts a queer reading of Crow and Clover. Revis wrote about being pretty mortified by some of the queer baiting on social media and the marketing, emphasizing that they were out of his control. While Revis admitted that the machine as a whole failed, he only acknowledged the queer baiting through paratexts, ignoring the queer subtext in the show itself. When asked directly about subtext laden scenes like the truck scene, Revis deflected responsibility onto other members of the creative process, saying, as a writer, I don't supervise a greenlight animation. I don't work with voice actors, and as the writer of that scene, I can promise you nothing was written on that page about bedroom eyes. Despite his repeated promises to bring a writer's perspective to the queer baiting conversation, Revis didn't actually offer any explanation for, or even acknowledgement of, the queer subtext in the show, instead hiding behind other parts of the creative process. Not only that, Revis pulled the classic, I'm sorry you felt hurt, instead of actually taking responsibility for show content and apologizing for the creative decisions that hurt people. While Revis promised, People have been working incredibly hard behind the scenes to make sure you and others feel heard. He offered no indication that anything will actually change, saying, At the end of the day, what comes of that is unfortunately out of my hands. When pressed on what action was being taken and faced with requests for specific measures like sensitivity readers or a commitment to include more explicitly queer characters, particularly MLM characters, the only response was silence, giving the queer audience no concrete reasons why they should trust the show again. Overall, Eddie Rivas' response boils down to a non-apology that said, I'm sorry you're hurt, but it isn't my fault as a writer. I'll try to make sure you're heard, but no promises. While I've criticized Mr. Revis's response pretty thoroughly, I do think that his attempts to discuss the subject were in good faith. It's worth noting that of the show's four writers, Revis is the only one who even acknowledged the controversy and the effect that Clover's death had on queer fans. The silence of the other writers is deafening. However, there was one last venue for the writers to potentially address the queer baiting controversy. This October, the Volume 7 Blu-ray was released, featuring exclusive commentary from the show's writers and directors, recorded in April of 2020. It was a venue for the creative team to offer their perspective on the events of the season and talk about what went right and what didn't work as well as they'd hoped. After the extended silence on the queer baiting, the commentary seemed like the last hope that the creative team would explain their choices regarding Crow and Clover, acknowledge the queer subtext between them, and maybe even admit their mistakes and promise to do better. That didn't happen. The commentary offers no acknowledgement of there even being a controversy, just a discussion of how Clover and Crow are just guys being pals, you know? The relationship was characterized like this. The journey that they go on is he goes from, Crow goes from kind of hating him to being envious, him, envious of him to then ultimately trusting him and befriending him only to have a tragic ending thanks to Tyrion, high emotions, and a lot of chaos. You see? They're just friends! No homo! When it came to the truck scene, Revis had this to say. I really love having this beat of like kind of Crow's rehabilitation, um, just kind of right in the middle of this episode, just to, just that, that there's another huntsman that's like taking an interest in just like him as a person and like, cause he's played this role as the mentor for so long. It's not gay. Clover's just taking an interest in him as a person. The flirtation at the Schnee Manor was described like this. You know, we have a little moment with Crow not wanting to get in the alcohol and me and Clover becoming bros. Just dudes being bros. They're bosom buddies, just like Clover's voice actor described them in a Twitch stream. The writers ignored their own subtext and the controversy it made by unwaveringly presenting Crow and Clover as platonic friends. 
This feeds into a narrative that exists in parts of the fandom, that there never was any queer subtext in Crow and Clover's relationship, and those criticizing the show for queer baiting had deluded themselves. As Joseph Brennan points out, producers who queerbait by necessity engage in gaslighting. By strategically ignoring the queer subtext, the writers functionally enabled the continued gaslighting of their queer fanbase. This refusal to acknowledge their queer subtext doesn't make that subtext stop existing or invalidate the queer reading of Crow and Clover. While they made the text, they are not the final arbiters of how it is interpreted, and their words don't make Clover and Crow any less queer. All they are doing is ignoring the legitimate concerns of queer viewers and pretending they have no reason to be upset. Instead of offering queer fans any sort of reassurance, the commentary actually gave them more reasons to distrust the creative team. After all the backlash they received for queerbaiting Crow and Clover's relationship, writer and supervising director Kerry Shawcross decided it would be a good idea to do more queerbaiting with Crow, this time with his relationship with Ironwood. This is how Shawcross, writer Kiersey Burkhart, and director Connor Pickens discussed the hug between the two after Crow's arrival in Atlas. The Crow Ironwood relationship um, is super interesting to me, and 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 seeing, uh, especially the moment coming up when they kind of have their little bear hug, uh, um, which I think Connor, you you originally suggested like maybe Crow's like hand slipping lower. Is that? Am I yeah, remembering I really that right? pushed hard for that, and you were for some reason against it. <laughs> This exchange is hauntingly reminiscent of Judith Fathala's definition of queerbaiting as a tactic where writers hint at a queer relationship only to laugh off the idea. Shawcross offered only silence when queer fans were desperately asking for a response and hoping that the show would pledge to do better in the future. Even after the backlash, the writers and directors joked and laughed about the idea of Crow being queer. It seems nothing has been learned. Where queer fans asked for reassurance, Shawcross only provided more reasons not to trust the show to actually tell the queer stories they hint at. Burkhart's description of the Crow Ironwood hug as the stuff for decades of fan fiction perhaps revealed the writer's attitude towards male-male romance most succinctly. Stories about men loving men are relegated to fan fiction, never to be realized in canon. Closing Thoughts where do we go from here? This leaves us with a bleak landscape moving forward. Clover's death hangs over the show in our world and the world of Remnant. Despite the months that have passed, queer fans haven't forgotten how the show hurt them. The unfortunate reality is there is no way to undo the harm the show did to a marginalized part of its fan base. The creators can't undo the pain queer viewers felt or the way they contributed to the gaslighting of queer fans. Even resurrecting Clover, as some have called for, wouldn't fully heal these wounds. Trust is a fragile thing. The first step to rebuilding trust is acknowledging mistakes and apologizing, but given the Volume 7 commentary and the year of silence from the creative team, that doesn't seem likely to happen. The only thing left is to see whether or not the creative team actually delivers the meaningful queer representation they say they want to provide. Ruby and Rooster Teeth have signaled to viewers that they are LGBTQ friendly through paratexts and by including queer supporting characters in the show and supplemental materials. It's been over a year since Eddie Rivas promised that the writers were planning to add more queer characters. And as of the production of this video, no additional characters have been confirmed to be queer. Although May Marigold had been paratextually announced as trans prior to Rivas's promise of additional LGBT plus characters, the show recently made notable strides by textually confirming her identity as a trans woman, a meaningful change compared to its earlier transphobia. However, the show's comically oversized central cast still doesn't have any explicitly queer characters, despite the romance that's been budding between Blake and Yang since Volume 2 and Crow's romantically coded relationship with Clover. All of the show's explicitly established women who love women were written out of the narrative by the end of Volume 6, 
and it never explicitly established any of its men as queer to begin with. Ultimately, if the writers have any interest in mending their relationship with their queer fan base, it's time that they actually provide the meaningful queer representation in Ruby they've promised, instead of continually baiting queer fans. All right, thanks for sticking with me to the end. I'd like to thank Bill, Anna, Julie, and Diana for lending their voices to this project and encouraging me to see it through. Diana's feedback and Julie's editing advice were invaluable to this essay, and they have my gratitude. Julie and Diana performed the heroic task of putting up with me talking about this subject for months, despite having never seen Ruby, so they clearly deserve an award. I'm considering making videos about how people conceptualize a work's canon, other issues in Ruby's writing, or simply discussing the Ruby writer's absolutely bizarre continued misreading of Captain America. So if you're interested in one of these topics, leave a comment to let me know what you'd like to see in the future. If you really enjoyed this video and want to financially support me, I have a Ko-fi where you can throw me a few bucks. My scope in this video was primarily examining the show content and the official and creative response, but if you're interested in more discussion of how the fanbase responded to Clover's death, how it fragmented queer viewers, and the different representation needs within the queer community, check out Vicaro's video. One last important revelation came from making this video. The question of why Crow's name is spelled with a Q has long puzzled fans, but now I can present you with the reason. It is, in fact, because he's queer. Cracked it! Anyway, they shouldn't have had Crow be the Scarecrow in their extended Wizard of Oz illusion if they didn't want us to think he's a friend of Dorothy's. Okay, that's it for my Queer Ruby stand-up routine. I'm S.C. Willard, and this sure has been a video essay. I hope to see you in the next one.